Good evening, everybody. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation. You're very welcome uh, here today. It's a kind of semi-anniversary or whatever a pre-anniversary, whatever an anniversary is that's ahead of the thing actually happening is because it's a month today. You all get to vote. Is everyone registered to vote? Not if you're an EU citizen, but everybody else. None of you are registered. One person registered. That's good. So that gets us on two. That's a 2% turnout rate. Okay, fine. All right. Just bloody register people, okay? Unless you're going to vote for bad people, in which case don't. Now, the, um, so it's one month to go. Elections in general used to get to set... That's a copious supply of bad people. Which one? All oh, right. Okay, we don't get to the punchline tonight. Like, uh, the, um, yeah, right. So elections are meant to decide the direction of the country for five years, or more recently, one year, two years, uh, and other things. And... The, but lots of trends take a lot longer to build up than that and last a lot longer in their effects on our societies and our economies. Um, and few big trends have done more shaping of that than inequality, um, the big increase in inequality in the 1980s in the UK, but over a longer period uh, in the United States. Now, at the time, lots of those debates focused on the social impact. So the proponents were saying, look, um, yes, we're more unequal, but we're all better off, so could you calm down, please, at the back? Uh, and the opponents, of which there were lots, uh, it's kind of hard to remember, but there were lots, said, uh, this is causing lots of social damage. This isn't the kind of country you want to live in, even if you're getting all this growth and it's really good in other uh, ways. But we've, that is not the debate we've got today. So the debate today is what does high inequality do to our economy, not just what is, the, is it socially desirable, is it an attractive thing to have in the first place. But it's a debate that's basically happening because of that historic high inequality has kind of run straight into the big feature of the last 10 decades, which isn't really the last 10 years, which isn't really inequality going up in the UK or lots of the world, but it's instead just income stagnation. So s stuff is unequal, and then we've added on to it, and it's rubbish for everybody. And the two together are really why we're spending all our time talking about this stuff, why the Resolution Foundation kind of bothers producing stuff full stop. So that is the thing uh, that is good to talk about, even if it's triggered by very bad things. But we've got a really good reason to talk about it tonight, which is that we're going to be talking about this book, Unbound, How Inequality Constricts Our Economy and What We Can Do About It. Uh, and we're lucky enough to hear from its author, Heather Boucher, first, who is the chief executive of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, which is like a kind of better funded resolution foundation in Washington. <laughs> but I say, small is beautiful. In some contexts, particularly think tanks. The, um, anyway, so we're going to hear from Heather about the uh, submit to her book, but then you can all buy it upstairs afterwards. And then we're going to hear from Martin, and you had a preview. He's really perky about the economic and political situation facing us all. So Heather's going to have to be really happy to keep us going. Mm -hmm. Right, Heather. And then we're going to hear from you guys. Heather, over to you. Wonderful. I think I'm going to stand at the okay. podium. And the, the clicker the is on here. the podium. Okay, great. This all we're, okay, good. And then I can see the slides because otherwise I'm oh good. And then I'm, I'm like in stereo here. All right. Yes, I'm doing a few slides. Yes. Um, so uh, it's just a real treat to be here this evening at the Resolution Foundation, one of my uh, favorite think tanks here in the UK, um, and always um, always a treat to be able to be here with you all. So I'm going to give you a brief rundown of um, what we have been learning at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth over the past um, six years. We launched in November of 2013. And we have a series of questions that we've been asking. Um, we work with academics all over the United States and all over the world. And we, we are constantly asking this question of whether and how inequality in all its forms affects the economy. We think that, you know, uh, as Thorsten said in the, in the um, introduction, these are, um, these are the issues that are defining our time. But what do they mean for productivity, for growth? How should we be thinking of them as economic concepts, not just as social or political ones, although they're all interconnected? And so what I'm going to tell you is a little bit about what we're learning from the latest cutting-edge empirical research in economics um, about how inequality affects the economy. And so the book is really the synthesis of our past six years of learning. So I'm going to start by showing you a few slides to make sure that we're all on the same page and we understand the economic trends. All of my data is going to be, of course, from the United States. Um, and then I'm going to uh, draw some conclusions about what we're learning from the empirical evidence, talk a little bit about what I think we should do about this. And to get right to the point, as the title of the book indicates, um, I think that the evidence really shows that there are a variety of ways that inequality constricts growth. And I'm going to make the argument that, um, in fact, given where the economics profession is, 
and the new kinds of data and evidence that we, that economists have been using for the past um, couple of decades, allowing us to show causality in a variety of new um, places, that this all points to the idea that economics is in the midst of a paradigm shift, um, where this idea that inequality matters is now becoming a part of the narrative and the story. And indeed, what I argue by the end of the book is that you know, we have these ideas of how the economy works, many of which were laid out um, in the early part of the 20th century. And those models, those theories about how the economy works, don't function as advertised so long as we have the kind of high inequality that we have in our society today. Because as long as you have this inequality, it calcifies into social and political power, and it's distorting the very way that the market works. And um, so in order to have the economy work as advertised, we need to do something about inequality, and that requires rethinking the institutions that constrain inequality itself. So that's the headline. So hopefully um, we can that'll give you a little bit of an indication how I'm going to walk through this. So let me quickly go to a few slides. These are The purpose of these is not to look at every little number, but to give you a broad brush of some of the trends. Um, and... <coughs> I think it's really important that we contextualize how we think about the economy with the changed climate of the economy, that we're seeing this change in how the economy works, so it's important to start there. So first, again, these are all from the United States. This is a chart with um, the income distribution on the x-axis, national uh, uh, income growth on the vertical axis. The horizontal purple line is the average income growth um, uh, in the aggregate in the United States from 1963 to 79. It's 1.7%. And you can see in the period from 1963 to 79, we were a nation that grew together. Um, over those decades, um, most Americans saw their incomes grow at the average. And the rich people saw their income grow less. The low-income people saw their incomes grow more. We've seen a series of distinct changes in this chart since then. There are three I want to point out. First, and we do not talk about this enough, growth has slowed. So national income between 63 and 79 was 1.7%. Since then, up to 2016, the latest data we have available, it's 1.3. So overall, we've seen this slowing in the aggregate measure of growth. Second, the United States is a nation that is clearly growing apart. So that horizontal line is still the average. And you can see that you know over this period from 1980 to 2016, the top is taking most of the income gains and the bottom is getting the least. But it's also important to note that our aggregate indicators of economic growth, this is national income, which is essentially akin to gross domestic product, GDP, is no longer telling us something about our country. 90% of the population is experiencing growth that's less than the average. So two weeks ago, when the Bureau of Economic Analysis released their new data on GDP and said, oh, it was 1.9% in the third quarter, that actually didn't mean anything. If it had been 1964, it would have been, oh, yeah, this meant something. Most people saw their incomes grow at that rate. But today, that doesn't mean anything. All we know is that a lot of rich people saw, probably saw their income growth more than 1.9%, and everybody else saw their income growth less. But it's really not a very useful metric of success. So a few more charts to just ground this conversation about how the economy's changed. The next one is that um, we've seen in the United States a sharp fall in absolute mobility. 1940, if you were um, uh, born in the early 1940s, nine, in, uh, nine out of 10 people grew up to outer in their parents. Among those born in 1980, only about half were outering their parents. That is a remarkable shift in a very short period of time in the probability of moving up. And that, I think, is one of the statistics that every time I look at this downward slope, I understand why people are angry and frustrated. The next statistic is the increase in inequality in wealth. So I want to draw your eye to that bottom um, line, bottom 50%. This is going back to 1989. What that figure shows you is that relative to 1989, the wealth of the bottom half of the U.S. income distri wealth distribution is just back to where it was in 1989. And this is from new data from the Federal Reserve. Um, I should note that the first chart was from data from Piketty, Size, and Zuckman. The second chart of mobility was from Raj Chetty and his colleagues. This data is um, new data from the um, Federal Reserve on distributional financial accounts. 
and um, it's been updated, so it's it's going through the um, I believe the second quarter of 2019. But this is remarkable. You can also see how clearly the wealthy recovered very quickly from the Great Recession and have seen a large increase in their wealth. So we're a country that's not only increasingly unequal in terms of incomes, less upward mobility, but a higher concentration of wealth across households and also across firms. So this is a measure of market concentration in the United States going back to 1989. When we think about inequality, we have to not just think about what's happening across people, but what's happening across firms. And we're seeing this market concentration as well. So, um, you know, if you, uh, so back in 1963, um, John F. Kennedy gave this speech where he said, a rising tide lifts all boats made this argument that what, econ what economic policy needed to do was to focus on increasing aggregate growth and everything else would, sorry, take care of itself. And of course, that is not the United States that, that I live in, that we live in today. And, um, you know, Gene uh, Sperling, who's an advisor to both the President Clinton and uh, President Obama, said, a rising tide lifts some boats, but others will run aground. Right? It's a very different story that we're telling. But what we haven't changed, um, I think in, in all the ways that we need to, is what does this mean for how we think about the economy? How do we think about what is it that's going to deliver that strong, stable, broadly shared growth that we want to see? And is it through policies that continue to focus giving more money and deregulating for those at the top? Or is it other policies that we need to think about and, and, and where should we go? And that starts by understanding the economics. So now I'm going to walk through what I see as the findings from the latest empirical research. And in the book, what I do through each of the main chapters is I focus on an economist whose research is emblematic of what we're learning from the latest empirical research. And then the rest of the chapter kind of fleshes it out. I got to interview each of the economists, so there's some great quotes. But it really is trying to tell the story of what's happening within the profession and the empirical evidence and how that adds up to a new story about how we should be thinking about inequality. So. Um, uh, I break it down into three ways that we see inequality constricting growth. So the first is what I think is the most obvious, which is that inequality obstructs growth by, um, by, by obstructing the supply of people and ideas into the economy, limiting opportunity um, for those not already at the top and slowing productivity growth over time. And here, I point to a couple of different um, pieces of evidence. The first chapter focuses on the development of human capital and how inequality is holding back children that are at the low end of the income distribution from realizing their full potential. Point to what I think is a very interesting um, body of research by an economist named Janet Curry, who looked at the effect of pollution on children's um, uh, life chances and opportunity. She had done work showing that children that are born at low birth weight um, we can trace out over their, um, their lifetimes, tend to have lower employment and earnings as adults. So, which is not to say that birth weight is destiny, but that those children who are born at a low birth weight, you can trace out lower employment and earnings. And so she said, okay, well, we know that children who are low income are more likely to live in neighborhoods that are marked by pollution. So she studied whether or not pollution affected birth weight through using the natural experiment of 9-11. So after the Twin Towers fell down, there was all this pollution in lower Manhattan. So she looked at mothers who had children before and after 9-11 to see if there was a difference in the, in, the, in the infant's outcome. And she found that those children born after 9-11 had a lower birth weight. And so from this, she takes that inequality has this demonstrable effect on future employment and earnings outcomes. And of course, I'm sure, you know, Anybody who thinks about labor economics, there's a whole bunch of different studies and examples. I think that one is like, it's very visceral though. Um, another example that I point to in the next chapter in terms of the ability to deploy that human capital once it's, once it's there is research by Raj Chetty and his colleagues. They did this really interesting study trying to understand how inequality affects growth through its effects on innovation. So they have data on everybody that ever applied for or received a patent and their incomes. And they match that data to data on those individuals when they were in the third grade and their third grade math test scores alongside their parents' income and the demographics of that individual. And so what they found is that lo and behold, 
kids that do really good on third grade math test scores are much more likely to grow up and get a patent, right? Totally makes sense. But if you look at that group of children that do really good on that test, you just look at that group, what they found is that the children from high income families, four times as likely to get a patent as children from lower income families. And boys more likely to get a patent than girls, white children more likely to grow up and get a patent than children of color, um, black and, and Hispanic children. And so what they take from that, they titled their paper, The Lost Einsteins. And so this is, a, this is a significant drain on our economy. And I actually think that one of the more important aspects of it, it's not just the drain, but it's who's being drained. So it's not that you have less innovators, and that's super important, but the kinds of things that low-income people might invent or women or black people might invent, they might be different than the kinds of things that boys and whites and rich people might invent. So we're not just missing things in our economy, we're missing things that actually connect with specific communities marked by inequality. So the next way that we see inequality affecting the economy is through its subversive aspects on the institutions that manage the market. And here, um, thinking about how inequality is making our political system ineffective and our markets dysfunctional. And um, you know, there's a in, in, for this part of the chapter when we first started equitable growth, we did this big project working with political scientists to understand the politics of inequality. And there's now a large body of research that shows how political polarization is connected to rising economic inequality. And of course, that's connected to our inability. Um, if I were doing a longer talk, I would talk about how or I'd show you some slides on how um, we've seen a decline in the United States in public investment, even though poll after poll shows that, the, that U.S. Um, citizens want more investments in education and in their communities. And at the same time, we've seen a decline in tax rates at the top. These things are directly connected to the influence of money in politics, but not just money in politics, but the rise of an elite that is setting the agenda. And increasingly, if the elite is not for something in American politics, it's not happening. And so there's solid empirical evidence from the political science research that makes that argument or that has those findings. But the other way that we see inequality subverting the institutions that manage the market is through the rise in economic concentration. So as we become an economy with more monopolies and oligopolies, you see those very firms that have this market power rewriting the rules to suit themselves. So you see Amazon buying up competitors and um, all the sorts of things that we talk about with this rising monopoly economy. And that that in and of itself is dragging down growth. Um, we see it reducing the amount of investment. There's evidence that the rise, in competi the, the rise in monopoly and the lack of competition is actually partially behind the decline in, pri in private investment in the United States. And it's also directly connected to how workers are faring because with the rise of monopoly and oligopoly, you're seeing the rise in what economists call monopsony. These are so many words with many syllables here. But monopsony is when there's a single buyer. And so in many communities in the United States today, workers are looking out at a labor force, a labor market, where they have few options of different employers. Like say you're a nurse and there's four or five hospitals. Well, they're all owned by the same firm. So even if you wanted to change jobs, your options are really limited, limits your bargaining power over wages, and also around working conditions. Been really important strikes recently about nurses really frustrated about conditions and the health and safety in these hospitals, but they're monopsonists. So the final way that inequality constricts growth is through distorting demand, both through its effects on consumption and investment. So the effects on consumption are somewhat obvious, right? If there's a lot of people that don't have a lot of money and a small group of people that has all the money, that's going to distort um, consumption. But the effects on investment, I think this is one of the most exciting new areas of economic research. Um, it was uh, one of my favorite chapters to write. Um, and um, I focused there on work by um, an economist named Atif Mian, who's done a lot of work with another economist, Amir Sufi. And one of the arguments that Atif is making is with the rise of wealth inequality, the rise of the concentration of wealth, this is leading into an increase in the supply of savings. And standard um, economics would tell you more savings, more investment. In macro, you actually learn that's such an important identity that it gets a three, it's three equals, right? But actually, he's a finance economist, and what he's been documenting is how that increased supply of money is actually going into credit. 
not for firms to invest, but for households, for household debt. This is inherently destabilizing, as of course connected to all of these other trends, the lack of income growth, the demand for more, um, for borrowing, but it is that supply of credit that is really, he argues, driving um, these distortions. So, having given you this quick run through of a lot of economics, and there's a lot of footnotes in this book, um, you don't have to read the footnotes, you just have to know that they're there, um, as I like to think. Um, so, I want to just close by focusing on what we can do about it. Um, where I ended in the book is that after, you know, you'd write this book, you spend all this time kind of like, you know, early in the morning thinking about what we should do. And I really came to the conclusion that we will not be able to address the distortions of inequality on our economy unless we confront the subversive aspects of the concentration of wealth and the concentration of market power. Um, and that, you know, even if we want to address these obstructions, they're going to be very difficult to do if you can't rally the resources to do them. Um, and certainly in the United States, if we can't tax and if you continually reduce taxes at the top, you don't have the resources necessary to make those public investments. So you really do have to confront how this concentration of wealth is affecting um, uh, political and social power. So I think you need to start there. Things like thinking about reform of the antitrust laws, how we address market concentration, how we tax capital. We've done a lot of work on wealth taxes, but also taxing capital at equitable growth. And then you can do things, and I argue in the book that we really need to make a lot of investments in early childcare and education, which is a place where the United States is particularly behind. But those are all really big things hard to do. They're not easy. They're going to require a lot of political will. And so I want to end with something that's actually very easy to do that I think could go a long way towards changing how we think about the economy and setting the stage. So this is a figure that shows U.S. GDP growth. It's actually national income growth, which is essentially the same thing, minus depreciation and a couple of other things, but they're akin. Think of it like GDP growth. This is going back to 1963. And so you can just see this trend. This comes out every quarter. Um, the data is revised five or six times. So this is, this is an indicator that moves markets. It is um, an indicator that we look at when we want to compare economic progress across countries. It's one of our important metrics of economic success. What is growth? So what we have been um, working with a bunch of economists to do is to disaggregate this. So this figure, it's the same numbers on national income growth, but it's showing who actually gets those income gains. So if you draw your eyes to the green at the top, and apologies for those of you who might be colorblind, I need to fix my charts so that they're easier to see. But if you look at, if you can't see the colors, if you look at the, um, that green, that's where, that's the top 1%, where the bulk of the money's going. And then you sort of, with your eye, add that up with that purple. That's the top 10% of the US economy. And if you look for the blue, that's the bottom half bottom half of the U.S. income distribution. You can see it's getting smaller over time. If you look at that, that gives you a very different understanding of economic progress and opens up new questions about what inequality means and how it's affecting our economy, it changes the conversation. So instead of seeing this report from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is you know, akin to what we received a couple weeks ago that shows GDP, we would like to see something that looks more like this where we're disaggregating it. And so we're starting our conversation about the economy by recognizing that we are living in a changed environment. It is no longer the case that a rising tide lifts all boats. It's no longer the case that we can talk about our economy as a whole in the aggregate without also confronting the ways that it is so unequal. And I think this will focus, if we could do this, and if we could do it cross-nationally in the same way that the OECD encourages us all to look at GDP, we could have a very different conversation about the role of institutions that constrain inequality, like unions, like laws around um, uh, that address market competition, and, um, and all the rest. And that could open up getting this kind of research and evidence that shows that inequality is dragging down our economy into our policy debates and discussions. I will end there. Great. Right, it's going to be attached. I knew I was forgetting something. Yeah, very good. That would have been ugly. <laughs> Martin, are you going to return to the stage? I'm just, yeah. I'm right there. Thank you, Heather, both for funding all that research and then the book summarising it all quite so neatly. Martin, over to you to bring us down.
So I will try to keep down very definitely below 10 minutes. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. I have to say that because of a slight breakdown in communication, I only received the book yesterday afternoon. that I am familiar with quite a lot of the research that you have referred to um, and, uh, and I have studied parts of it fairly carefully. Um, I'm going to address seven issues and I'll address them very quickly. The first is, is the overall story presented here about the US in particular plausible and I think and convincing? Um, and my answer to that is yes, I think it pretty clearly is plausible and convincing. The research that has developed in this area in the US with the enormous resources of data and, and economists is astonishing and I think a model for other countries which um, pretty consistently don't do anything comparable um, despite your heroic efforts here. Um, particularly our, I think our academics do surprisingly little of this sort of work and I'm a bit puzzled by that. Yeah. Um, the second question is why has this happened? Um, and particularly, which is of course not discussed in Heather's um, account, um, why has it happened to such a severe degree in the US? Now the evidence is uh, uh, um, pretty clear uh, that not only the levels of inequality, but the, above all the steady increases and steady and continuous increases in inequality, the scale of those increases, um, the associated stagnation of real incomes of a huge part of the society, um, well over half, um, the medium level, in medium level, I'm not even talking about the poor, is considerably worse than in pretty well all other high-income countries even here and much worse than in continental Europe. So there are real differences across economies in both pre-tax and even more post-tax distributions and tendencies. Some of this occurs because of course uh, other countries including even here, even ourselves, but far more continental Europe has far more developed redistributive systems but some of it is clearly also because they have had, for one reason or other, far more what, of what Ed Miliband called pre-distribution. That is to say, the inequalities never got so big before tax. And I think we need to have a much better understanding than we do, though there are some work has been done on this, particularly at the OECD, of why this divergence has occurred. And, uh, but my own supposition, there's a third point, is that a crucial element in paid, in paid in the US by fundamental ideological characteristics of the post-1980 system, but even the pre-80 system, the far greater resistance to a welfare state and the far greater acceptance of inequality as an idea, and the unique role that race and racial politics plays in the US. I could talk about that at much greater length I coined, I think I coined, somebody can correct me, but I haven't found it earlier in 2006, the phrase Pluto populism to describe American politics, or at least I've been using it happily since 2006. And it is basically the relationship between the plutocracy and the angry white middle class, which is of course the coalition that has brought Donald Trump to power. I think I'm on four, uh, which is uh, an interesting puzzle, given what Heather says, which is given that inequality in Europe, continental Europe, has generally remained much lower um, and, the, the, and the, the tendencies have been much less adverse uh, than in the US, why didn't Europe do far better than it did? If you buy the hypothesis that rising high levels and rising inequality is so detrimental to growth, which I don't find difficult to accept, then it seems to me that European economies where this has not occurred 
France, for example, the evidence is has experienced no rise in ex post-tax inequality at all in the last 40 years. Um, why haven't they done much, much better? They've also invested far more, by the way, both from the public and the private sector. And I think it's a puzzle. I don't have an answer. Um, Thomas Philippon, in a book I've just reviewed, which is, I think, also superb, uh, which looks at actually adds to the puzzle further by saying that over the last 20 years, the Europeans have created a much more competitive economy as well than the American economy. But even so, US productivity growth is right at the top of the G7. So there is a real set of puzzles. You might have to look at other assets of the US, which I think are significant. The fifth point is, and it's crucial, um, can anything realistically be done? Mm -hmm. I have been very influenced, perhaps because of my classics background, by a very, very depressing book, which I read a couple of years ago, quite controversial, by Walter Scheidel, who's an ancient historian who works in Stanford of, uh, of German origin, not relevant to this, by the way, um, who basically says, if you look at what we know about inequality, and the changes in equality over the last 8,000 years. There is a surprising amount of evidence on this, though, of course, the data for 8,000 years ago and the ancient Rome are not as good as we would hope. Nonetheless, there's a surprising amount. And the basic conclusion he draws is that any civilized, stable society without catastrophe tends to get cumulatively more unequal over time. And this is pretty obvious. Rent extraction is the system at the top. And he puts forward evidence, which I found staggering, that in the case of the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire, inequality, and then we've got some evidence for other empires, inequality became as big as it could be, which means that the incomes of the bottom 97, 90% were so low that if they'd have been any lower, they would have all died. And even so, this inequality remained. The only thing that changed it was war, revolution, or a plague. This is very depressing. Um, but it's not trivial because Piketty's work also shows that the great event which transformed uh, income and wealth inequality in the Western world was the Great Depression and the Second World War. And we've got worse basically ever since. After that 20 year halcyon post war period, everything went to hell again. Um, this is a very depressing story and I think it's relevant because what it's telling you above other things is that in normal times, established political institutions, whatever their form, favour the top 1%. And in America, I can't see for the life of me how anyone will be elected who will make any difference whatsoever to where you are. Um, uh, not with your Supreme Court, not with the likelihood that you will have incredibly narrow margins in for the Democrats in the, the House and the Senate, even if they've got a majority in both and the presidency. The 2008 to 10 experience uh, is a horrifying warning of how little and how little time, how little you can do and how little time you have to do it. The sixth point I wanted to make is that actually some of these ideas, this is the advantage or disadvantage of being uh, um, very old, is what I believe is now called OK Boomer. So this is, <laughs> this is me as Boomer. Glad we got that out of when I went to the World Bank in the 1970s, the most advanced study, studying being done by the Development Research Center, which influenced me a lot, was something called redistribution with growth. And its basic idea was exactly the one Heather put forward, which was aggregate GDP growth in developing countries was telling you absolutely nothing because most of them were so unequal. And in fact, basically what we were measuring was just the growth of income accruing to the top 10%. The rest was essentially invisible. So they suggested, why not reweight GDP to give weights, uh, um, essentially marginal utility weights across the entire system. This is a more sophisticated version of that. What I find frightening is that that was work was convincing, compelling, and completely disappeared. I hope you do better this time. And the final thing I wanted to say, which brings it all together, is that 
uh, I'm writing a book on the relationship between the market economy and democracy. And what this whole story brings out is how difficult the relationship is. We haven't discovered, uh, in my view, I know some people here and in the Labour Party would disagree with me, but we haven't discovered a better way of running an economy than one that has a pretty strong market element. And I certainly think we haven't discovered a better way, part China, of running a polity than a dem democracy, though we can discuss how to improve it. But getting these two things to run together successfully over time is absolutely the limits of our capacity. Most of the time we fail, and the trouble is if we fail, one of two things can emerge. Either a predatory plutocracy, which is where we seem to be, or a completely insane demagogy. And uh, that challenge, I think, now confronts he us here and in pretty well every other Western society. Thank you for listening. So thank you, Boomer. Not just open, <laughs> the, um, uh, for that. Now, look, we've got before we open up for, for questions. Let's try and take a number of the things Martin's raised, but also that, that come directly out of the book. A kind of what is the the critiques or the so we can. I'm trying. Yours are all on one side. So I'm going to try and add some on the more optimistic side. But on the but let's start on the the book's too optimistic side of the critique. So. A direct focus on US politics just says, good luck, any of this happening. Um, even if Elizabeth Warren gets herself elected, she ain't going to be able to do anything. Uh, then she'll be seen to fail, and then you'll end up back where you started anyway, and it's a very long game. Um, a slightly less pessimistic and slightly less US-focused version of it says, what's going on is a... Fairly, Part of what is going on is economic underperformance feeding into political problems, but that feedback loop then feeding back to economic underperformance because no one wants to invest in our economies because they think we're going to tank it all. So we elect mad people, so they tank it, so nobody wants to invest in anything. You kind of get the loop, yeah? So it's hard to break it. So that's a slightly more theorised rather than US-focused version. So are you massively too optimistic? Well, you know, <laughs> I've worked in Washington, D.C. for 20 years, so I'm obviously delusional um, because, you know, we keep thinking that we can do things differently and, and hopefully make some changes. I mean, I think that what I mean, so I mean, really, what is this optimism? Right. I mean, so it is our jobs as people that are thinking about policy to try. I mean, that's so I mean, maybe it's quixotic, but you know, it's our job to make the best arguments we can to hopefully mobilize people to make the best decisions that they can to try to revitalize our democracies in the most important ways, and to have good ideas about how we can create an economy where we can have strong, stable, broadly shared growth. So I am under no delusion that any of this is easy. And that's actually why I end with the thing that I feel like I have the most control over, which is how we talk about the economy in the media. It's a very simple thing. And actually, while I, I've been here in the UK for um, six days, but while I was here, the Bureau of Economic Analysis announced that they are going to start their pilot. So we will start to see these kinds of data. And that, that I think, could be powerful. It's not everything, but you have to kind of start with what you can control. Um, but you, I, you presumably think we should try. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I agree with the idea that um, um, only what measures counts. So uh, what is measured counts. So one should try to measure these things, of course. Yeah. What happens if Elizabeth Warren wins? Is she be able to do anything? Well, you know, the big question is, does she have the Senate? A number of senators in the Democratic Party have just announced that they're not going to um, agree to get rid of the filibusters. So they're already tying their hands behind their backs. Um, I do think, though, you know, what we've seen is that um, this House, which is democratically controlled, has put democracy reform as its first piece of legislation. And that, I think, does bode well for thinking about the long term. It's something that Democrats have not prioritized. You're also seeing a lot more attention to things like sectoral bargaining and changing our labor laws. Um, there's also a lot of all a, a lot of the market structure pieces can be done through the regulatory state, and she is definitely going to do that if she's elected. I think other candidates will as well, but um, I think the big one on how you reallocate resources, and that that I think affects both the redistribution and the pre-distribution pieces. That is only possible through either a significant recession that causes a big piece of legislation or significant control by the Democrats. 
Okay. Now, this is then to both of you, given you're coming at this from one side, which is maybe this is all too pessimistic. So maybe the US is a basket case, I'm sorry, um, but inequality hasn't really been rising much apart from the very top in Britain since 1990. Yes, on housing costs it's got a bit worse, but the big picture is the rise is done. Wealth inequality in Britain's been falling since the 1980s, probably towards record lows below Germany, below Sweden, below China, below France, below America. Um, uh, and we have campaign finance laws that mean rich people can't totally buy our politics. Um, so it's rubbish, but it's not getting any worse here. And maybe we should just abolish America, it'll be fine. Well, and you have parliament, so once you are in power, you get something done. So that used Supposedly, to be true. That used to be true. <laughs> so we've, sorry, sorry. we've decided I'm that confused. is rubbish. Yeah, that's rubbish as well. <laughs> The last time we did that, we had a referendum. Yeah, okay, well, that's, that, yeah, that was crazy. Wait, and that is why we stopped doing it. Yeah. Okay, anyway, sorry, let you ask the question. No, no, I Abolish think... Abolish America. I actually... Well, that's, Apologies yeah. to any Brexit supporters yes, in the room. Yes, exactly. Um, I actually think that that's a fine argument, that, um, but, uh, I mean, if you didn't abolish America and you were sort of still left with us, I think actually the places in terms of the reduction in tax rates on the corporate side that are creating this race to the bottom that affects other countries, right? Because this is a global, we work in a global economy. I think that the market structure pieces, if I were living in Europe, I would be so focused on what is not happening in the United States in terms of rising market concentration and what's not, ha you know, so you've got the United States, which is allowing greater and greater concentration, and you've got China, which is doing the same. And I think that these markets are, are global. So that, those to me seem, you can't, you're not gonna be able to avoid those. So, so we have to abolish globalization as well to get ourselves Yeah, out. but we don't, but we, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, we're not going to do that. So Sorry. Fine. Okay, okay, then right, we've done too optimistic and too pessimistic. Let's Can try I and just comment on yes, that one because it's very important. Yep. Obviously, the, the institution we've decided for some reason to leave uh, and its competition directorate in particular, which is a main theme of Philippon, has actually decided to take on the concentration, it's a very big market, the concentration, particularly in tech, on... Uh, and here, probably the un we, EU is providing a global public good of great significance because it doesn't have any domestic industry to protect, which is linked, of course, with its fa the failures which I mentioned. But you might imagine that the EU could come to your rescue by basically presenting your biggest tech companies with some really very unpleasant choices. I, I enjoy every article I read about that in the FT, so yes. <laughs> Um, that's true. That's a small comment. No, that's good. Now, so too optimistic, too pessimistic. What about just generally too cautious? So you ended on all we can control is the data or how we talk about it. So that's definitely true. And, you know, we've got to get out of bed in the morning running think tanks. So that's desirable. But um, the book, getting out of bed, that is, the book says, sort the data out, spends a lot of time saying we need to unblock the roots to meritocracy. If it's going to be meritocratic market, that brings benefits. You advocate the market economy. We need to make sure everyone has the opportunities to match their talents to the opportunities available and to create patents and innovations. It doesn't spend as much time saying, actually, the underlying problem is just this inequality is too high. Meritoc meritocracy itself is a problem. Um, and we need to smash all this down, which is quite zeitgeisty over here right now. OK, so the question is, are we being too cautious on the remedies proposed? by not being root one, the problem is just the level of inequality and the reliance on meritocracy. Let's squash everything and then all these other problems will just be less of an issue. So interesting. So, you know, in the book, and I think um, when you say meritocracy, I think what I'm hearing you, let me see if I'm understanding yeah. the question in the, in the way you're asking it. Are you saying that it's about the top 10 or 20 percent and that we should be focusing on them rather than... No, the no, I'm just saying, say, say we believe, as in, I think it's your, it's your um, first section, which is if we unblocked all of the impediments to the market functioning from inequality so that somebody could always rise to the top if, that, if they were, that's where their talents best took them and if they had an innovation possible in them, they would get the chance to do it. But we would still have very high inequality if we accept that meritocracy is remotely giving us the distribution, mm -hmm. so, which obviously we don't, but some people might think it represents a distribution based on the productivity outcomes of those results. So, but why don't we just say, right, we're just not having it. We're just not having those big gaps. We're going to have much smaller gaps. Uh, yes, there will always be people who get some more uh, better chances amongst that, but we can give fairer chances, but it'll still be unequal. But so we're just going to make sure that the gaps are never that big.
That's a great question. So, and you're right. I so the the big place where I focus in the book is on taxing the top. So focusing on you know in the United States in 2017, we actually passed into law tax reform that um, makes the taxes on capital lower than income in some in many cases. So that that's a good place to start is how we tax capital, how we tax at the top, do we tax wealth, how we think about inheritances, that whole bucket of things. Um, and I, what I don't focus on, though, is issues, and it's just you know time and space. But you're bringing up um, uh, quite appropriately is whether or not we think about doing things to limit CEO pay. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not I, you know, I think at some point I do mention that we should get you know workers to the extent that we have unions, but revitalize those and get um, folks on boards. But I do think those that conversation is a really interesting one. Um, and I think that the reason that I actually didn't focus on the book is that it feels very, it feels like there's a lot of details in there that, that we still have to be working out. There's also been a big conversation in the United States over the past few years about employee ownership, which is something that, you know, I think is worthy of discussion, but it's, but I, but I'm not, to, I, I don't have a clear, my own sense on that one yet. Martin, just crush the gaps. And then it won't be well, that's clearly the um, the theme, um, a theme in the R election. Um, obviously, very important. One of the things that, and this is not in a way an answer. One of the things that fascinates me is why. I mean, again, across countries, the gaps are so different, and the. Um, I mean, for, to take an example, in the second largest, where I've just been, the second largest capitalist economy, Japan. I mean, the sorts of pay that we would regard as normal for CEOs, let alone America, just unthinkable. And the um, and it seems to me that an enormous part of that, some of that is determined as, again, Piketty argued, I think reasonably persuasively, and others in that school, by top marginal rates. If they're very high, then people will go for it. But top marginal rates opposite, have fallen. The opposite of what Thatcher said would happen. Yeah, yes. top marginal rates have fallen everywhere. But the the um, uh, the US is not even exceptional. It's top marginal rates if you include if you include state taxes compared with us, for example, and many other developed countries. And yet it's in the US and UK that the pay exploded. So it seems to me that there was a profound change in the social norms governing corporations. And I am afraid I don't know what to, how to change social norms. Now, obviously, the government can simply have a pay policy. Uh, we, uh, and I presume the Labour government will have a pay policy of some kind. Um, unfortunately, I'm old enough, again, OK, Boomer, to remember pay policies. And I remember very well the immense energy that was put in by C CEOs to find innumerable ways around it. So I'm not very convinced, but I'm open to persuasion what about that this is going to turn out to be fantastically fruitful. Where I have focused myself much more in my own writing is corporate governance. Yeah. And uh, and I think that is something that we need to reform very, very significantly, though it's quite a problematic well, area. And let me add two things. So one is that it was both, so the, when the Business Roundtable in the United States, which is this group yeah. of um, corporations, uh, you know, they announced that they they were going to no longer um, they no longer thought that shareholder value was the way they should be running their their corporations. Now there was no meat behind their statement, and it was a lovely statement. It was nice sentiments, and and that would be great. But there has been a lot of discussion about well, okay, so what what could we do to sort of encourage them to make this real? But I thought that that to me, I mean, even though there wasn't you know real um, legs behind it, the fact that they felt that they had to say that. What is culture, right? What are norms? It's when you know a society right. feels like, oh, well, we, we, we need to say this because we've decided that other people think that it's wrong. And so I was thrilled when that happened, even though, you know, like, what is it going to mean in real time? There's a lot of questions, but it was thrilled because it meant that they were getting the message. I also think that the conversation that is happening in the Democratic primary around taxing wealth, whatever you think of the merits of that as an economic policy, so happy to talk about that, but putting that aside for just a moment, everybody understands it. It's very easy to explain. I can explain it to my mom, right? You don't have to. You don't have to understand anything about step up and basis and all the things we talk about in Texas. But it's also been amazing to see how compelling that is. That people are like they have enough. They have enough. They can share, and that. So it is true that across economies. 
you know, you have these these policy indicators that may kind of look the same, but how they're playing out in a culture and through the institutions, I do think that pushing these conversations and the fact, honestly, and this is, I will end this little, the fact that so many of the, I mean, that all of the newspapers over the past week have been about all of the Democratic donors are so afraid of Elizabeth Warren, they're begging anybody and everybody to run into this this primary, because I really want like 30 people in it again. But that too, I think, speaks to the fact that the culture is changed, that there is this that there is this fear that their culture is going to change. And in Britain, it's really easy because we've got a lot of cultural shame that could easily be exploited. Yeah, we don't have a lot of that. So you've got less shame. Well, I mean, it's unsolved, but seriously. Well, while, while the, uh, obviously, there's been very large rise in chief executive pay in the UK um, from the base, I mean, we are talking about an order of magnitude difference. I mean, literally, an order of magnitude difference in absolute pay levels yep. uh, between the top American CEOs, where we're talking about several hundred million dollars a year in some cases at the very top, and and low millions for us for the, for the low millions. And I'm not trying to defend this, okay. but I'm, the point is. It, the, one, the big point I made there, the US is in some very obvious way a, an incredibly important, incredibly influential, but also unique case. Freak show. Now, let's get some questions. We have some mics. Uh, there's a question at the front here. We have, do we have one mic before I start promising? Right. Uh, What's you your name, sir? Vikram Shah. Uh, you, you said about uh, corporate shame, but we have in this country at least lost political shame altogether. When you put more and more tax on either corporation or wherever, uh, it counts who is in charge of spending that tax money. And if you have got Chris Grayling kind of people who are going to while away your money, then you don't want to spend that kind of tax money. Thank you for but dragging us straight down to Chris Grayling. <laughs> <laughs> so I honestly didn't see that coming. But. <laughs> but that, that, that's what happens. You people are actually leaving. <laughs> Because of Chris uh, Grayling. You, 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 you keep on taxing more, but you don't spend it okay. wisely than you have. Okay. But, but my, my, sorry about that. But, but <laughs> my, my concern is that, have you ever considered, one of your democratic contender is now talking more and more about universal basic income. Mm. And Labour has done that in the last couple of weeks, that they are going to start an experiment with that. How do you think universal basic income can answer that question about equality coming to a point where it may not matter altogether. Okay. And there's a gentleman in the middle here. We'll take these two in the middle together. Thanks very much. Uh, David Sharp. Um, I'm interested in, well, we assume from your comments that inequality is a bad thing, but I'm interested to know how you judge inequality of wealth versus inequality of income and the relationship between the two. Um, and if you're trying to tackle what is a massive systemic question, where do you start and how do the linkages work through? Okay. Uh, and the other thing which you didn't really cover very much was what evidence is there that you'd get a better growth outcome from that? Okay, great question. Uh, yeah, I'm just a, I'm a Damien Matic. I'm interested in um, employee ownership and the lack of research, especially in the cooperative movement. Um, there's some pretty stunning examples globally where uh, communities have organised and developed very strong economic models that have lasted generations and uh, generated multi-million dollar, billion dollar businesses. Okay, great. Right, now, so leaving Chris Grayling aside, um, why would we give any money to people, given that pol politics has gone a bit rubbish, so why would anyone, is that now constraining in of itself our ability to raise tax revenues, because why would we give money to rubbish people and, U and UBI, which always comes up, which I promise you is never going to happen when they're yeah. governed, but that's a separate issue. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, that's what you see in all of the, the research on taxation, is that people want, people want public investment, they're afraid that their tax dollars aren't being used that way, they'd be happy to raise taxes if they thought it was being used well, so there is that vicious cycle. On UBI, I mean, as an American, looking at it as an American policy, I have a long list of concerns. Um, first and foremost, in most conversations that I've been in about UBI, people talk about, I mean, it is, it, I mean, so if you're talking about giving everybody, like $12,000 or whatever it is that you're going to give them over the course of a year, um, there are big questions about where's that money going to come from. And so are you going to do that all through a wealth tax? Is that the best way to spend it if you were to do it? So how, how are you going to do that? And if you're not going to raise all of that money um, in an era where we've seen the, I mean, we are now at, at you know lows over the past 50 years or so is and um, of 
revenue as a share of GDP. We don't have a lot of tax revenue to do anything with. And um, a lot of conversations I've been in talk about, oh, we can do UBI, and then we can cut all of these other social benefits. We're already very much at the bottom. And every time I've heard somebody say that, I've been like, so you, have you ever been a low-income woman like with children trying to figure out how you're going to make ends meet? Um, are, are you disabled? Do you have a disabled family member in your, in your family that you need to take care of? And of course, I think that part of this conversation is happening outside of the context of the actual existing social welfare state and that these things are absolutely necessary. So UBI on its own, it sounds great. Alaska has this wonderful, the state of Alaska takes its oil revenue, cuts a check for every citizen, about $2,000 a year. Great program. I mean, so th there's ways that you could do this that could be really wonderful, but I have questions about where the revenue comes from and if it's gonna be in competition with other things, given where we are, we need national universal child care and early child and early care education. That that's not something that a UBI check is going to cover. We need to be doing something to address climate change. I'm really worried that if we do a wealth tax and we don't make those investments, we are going to lose generations. Um, and so I I feel like we need to be focusing on what our society needs to be doing together, um, rather than this sort of uh, idea that uh, you know it's every man for himself. Can I just comment on this because yep. I feel very strong? I think UBI is a snare and a delusion. Uh, and it's fairly simple. By definition, UBI involves staggering amounts of churning. By definition. You all understand what I mean, right? You're taking money from taxpayers and giving it straight back. Many of whom, at least half the distribution, don't need it. So to get income to the people who really need it, at levels that are relevant to them and cover things like childcare, it has to be very, very high for everybody, which means very simply that there are only about five countries in the world that can do this on the basis of anything like Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Norway for sure, and possibly France. We are about 15 to 20 percentage points of GDP in tax revenue too low to make a good job of it, in my view. And what is 15 to 20 percent of GDP? That's about 600 billion pounds, I think. No, 20 is 600 billion pounds. So it's not serious unless you're prepared to propose Denmark level taxes and not even Labour is prepared to do that. And if we go for UBI with our tax levels, we are gonna cut the, the benefits that go to people who really need them to the bone. All right. And that makes so sense. No. Right. So I'm seriously okay. no. Wealth versus... Yes. Well, uh, we have a big argument in the FT about this, by I the way. I love it, I love it. Yeah, you know, the other Martin is dangerously pro. But you can, yes. you can sort it. But he's a Scandinavian. He thinks we should have Swedish oh, yeah, but I'm tax. Like, I'm, I'm a bit. He I'm, I'm thinks like we should have. Scandinavian. If you, I don't want to do that. If but. you argue Swedish, you can't just put it all down to his Scandi name. <laughs> just in a, he's actually okay. But that's the point. You need those tax. Okay, right. Is that of hand? Wealth versus income inequality. So I mean. I think you, I mean, that, that is a really important question. What we learned from Piketty, which, you know, I feel like we're still all processing, right? He talked about how income inequality, incomes, high incomes calcify into wealth and what that means and what that means for the society. And you, I think you have to think about that, those concentrations of resources. Um, and, the, you know, and at Equitable Growth, we broaden it to looking across firms because when you kind of step back, you see a similar kind of dynamic. You have this concentration of resources. It leads to this um, uh, increase in power uh, socially or politically or economically. Um, and so I think you do have to start there. How do you break that up? And then, you know, kind of when you take that long arc and you think about what it is that created the innovation that makes these market economies so vital is the idea that people can find their match in the world, be that, you know, a high flying innovator or just finding, you know, becoming a chef or whatever it is that they want to do, right? Finding their best fit, that that is part of what makes them vibrant and gives them um, the productivity gains that we want to see. So in terms of the evidence around growth, um, I think if you focus on wealth, and this is based on data for the United States, um, you know, I, to, to me it keeps coming back to what is that, what are those concentrations of wealth being used for? 
So what we're in, so I, I rely hev heavily on Thomas Philippon in my competition chapter, um, and you know, and, and his new book is very interesting. But what we're what we're seeing in the United States is that private investment is lower than one would expect it to be, given the amount of profits in our economy. So that, that brings up some really fundamental questions. We've got this rising wealth inequality, this rising concentration of wealth, we've got this rising market concentration, but firms are not making those investments and they're borrowing you know, in, in the aggregate a lot. Something wacky is going on. And so I think that the, when you step back and you think about, okay, well, if we were to tax that wealth or we were finding ways to break that up, could it be put to better uses? Right, and could you make the argument to the public that um, that the that a government that the that the public sector could make a better investment in whatever it is that they want to do? I mean, we have bridges that keep falling down in the United States. We've got infrastructure. We've got lead in our water. We've got a lot of public investments that we need to be making. Let alone the, um, media, the you know amelioration of climate change, which is going to require a huge amount of public investment um, in the things that we need to do. So it's whether or not you can make that argument, but certainly these are about long term growth. And I think, well, I was going to talk about climate changing, but I'll stop there. We yeah, that, maybe... we, we, we've got one round of questions. Climate yeah. change goes on a while. Oh, okay, yeah. So, right, let's get one more set of questions. And then we need to release people to the night. There's a lady in the middle here, and the gentleman next to her as well. I'd like to go further. Oh, Kate Gimlet. I'd like to go further into the Alaska model for a moment, because I guess about five years ago, there was a book called The Public Wealth of Nations. Had some I think that might have gone out. Or I, anyway, the idea of creating a sovereign wealth fund, uh, which is a different model from anything that we have, that creates income streams, actually has is tasked with raising the level of investment, tasked with raising participation in new industry. And I wanted to know if you'd done any thinking about that, what observations you might have, because I know that Alaskans love their dividend very much. Great. And the gentleman next to you? Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Josh. I'm an analyst in the civil service. Um, so Kate stole the kind of the essence of my question, really. Uh, so I think all I'll just add to that is just to ask, I mean, a lot of what's been discussed is a lot of the proposed solutions to the problem of inequality has been uh, wealth taxation, uh, there was some discussion about kind of antitrust and um, pro-competition regulation, very much from like the liberal toolkit of kind of reducing inequality. I just wanted to kind of see how you thought that weighed against kind of what Kate mentioned, the idea of kind of, um, if you like, democratising capital or funds. So obviously, the UK Labour Party is a policy now where you know large firms will have to issue small percentage of equity every year uh, to kind of work around funds. I know Bernie Sanders in the states. Mm -hmm. a similar plan um, alongside broader kind of corporate governance reforms and I kind of just f wondered if you could kind of give your preference if you like between those two okay of philosophies that was great and then there's one gentleman here and then we'll wrap up because I'm conscious people need to escape hi Neil Never taking a night off from voter ID and looking forward to sending the um, minimum income uh, or not um, serious question about um, wealth inequality um, you, the two slides you had up about um, both about our children will not get what we had, if you're, especially if you're a baby boomer, and the 1% and then the 9%, yeah? Intergenerational wealth transfer is going to certainly, in this country, become an increasingly big feature. Where does that fit with overcoming inequality in terms of life chances? Great question. Brilliant. Right. So let's take Kate and Josh together. Um, why don't we start, which can collapse either into a specific stuff on do you particularly want a sovereign wealth fund or do you want either employee or state ownership of firms, but basically do you want more socialised ownership of stuff and less private ownership? Martin, why don't you have a go? Uh, God, these raise so many different questions. Well, suppose we have to distinguish, um, and I'm not quite clear I'm still not clear um, what John McDonnell has in mind. Whether you, if you're talking about employee share ownership, the issue is control rights, or the issue is wealth. Um, uh, if the issue is control rights, and I think it is to him, or I think the wealth redistribution aspects of this are actually relatively small, as far as I can see. But the control rights aspect is quite significant. 
because workers would collectively end up with quite large positions in firms relative in Britain where generally ownership is very distributed that would give them a lot of concentrated voting so to me the interesting question is how those votes would be exercised and how the power will be exercised my strong impression and I haven't studied in detail actually it's going to end up with the government um, that's my understanding but I might be wrong but anyway in terms of then in terms on the wealth distribution side um, I can see an argument for a sovereign wealth fund, but if you don't have a lot, the question really is how do you start it? Basically all the big sovereign wealth funds in the world that, that I'm familiar with start with a huge resource boom. We could have done it to a small degree with our oil wealth, but it's all gone, and it wouldn't have been all that big. It would have been great for Scotland, which is why Scotland should have seceded 40 years ago. But the, <laughs> stupid people, but the, but the, I, you could imagine, this is, so last, I have had this idea, I've never written about it, you go out and borrow two trillion, at the moment it seems to be for nothing, and you invest it in the stock market. There you've got an instantaneous uh, sovereign wealth fund. Um, uh, the, the... Um, this has gone seriously downhill. <laughs> the, that's an interesting idea which would have really extraordinary risk properties, which by the way is exactly exactly what every pension fund in the country has mm -hmm. been told not to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> so let me just add just a this couple. Is correct. Let me just add a couple of things. On this question of control, um, yeah. one of the things that I think is interesting um, from the United States is that you have all of these um, pension funds for workers, some of which are owned by unions, some, you know, the, the union pension funds, that, um, you know, it creates this, uh, you know, even if you have control, what are the incentives, right? And so that's created some really complicated questions, right? Do you want this this investment fund to make the most money? Do you want it to be invested in, in people with better jobs? How are you adjudicating that? Who's making that decision? What kind of evidence do they have? Exactly. That, you know, that I, that's, um, that there's a whole, there's a whole question there. What do you do, what you do with it? Yeah. That's the key question. And, and, um, and, <laughs> I, and it would be different, you know, in a country like ours where um, there are fewer people, I like to get this fact in in every talk I give, but um, there are fewer people today in unions as a share of the private sector workforce than there were before we made them legal in the United States, um, before we made the right to um, collectively bargain legal. So, you know, so pension funds may not be the best example because if it's a small minority, but anyway. Um, but on this question of the... Um, of the wealth fund, I, and this is not something that I've spent a lot of time looking into, but after this trip, I was talking to somebody earlier this week I want to look into, um, is you know how you could maybe use something like a carbon tax to, um, or some, some something like that. They could um, create a wealth fund, kind of like you do in Alaska, but where that fund could be specifically targeted at the kinds of green investments that you want to make. So could you take away some of that decision power, you know, put it in some sort of bucket there? I don't know. I'm not sure where that would go, but it seems at least something that I think worth um, thinking about. If you want to have a look at... Um, That's the Green New Deal idea, isn't it? Kind of, yeah. A lot of other stuff. There's in a lot of stuff, other in stuff the US. in it. It's a big yeah. bucket. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not necessarily well, like... I read, I criticised it for that reason, so I can't... What, being a big bucket? That it was so difficult to work out what actually was the essential green part of it, as opposed to all the other parts of it. Oh, well, that is hard. Now, so, the, um, so a chart for you. Okay, I can't draw it here because this doesn't work yet from my head. Okay, but if you look up a chart of um, public wealth versus private wealth in Britain, and look what happens to Britain post the 1980s, and you watch the chunk of public wealth, oh, yeah. which doesn't even include the oil wealth that we're flocking off at the time, disappear as it's sold at discount rates. The private sector. There was your sovereign wealth fund. And it ain't coming back. What's our public, what's our net worth as a state today? Negative. So you can't flog it twice, it turns out. One of the laws, well, you can't normally, unless you're a really good salesman. That's so the, um, as depressing as my union staff. But you could do what I suggested. We could do, we could do what you're suggesting. It's not clear to me that the gap in our world is that the British state is not exposed enough to our stock market. Well, that... But I take, you could. I wouldn't recommend it, but I'm just <laughs> okay. saying you could do it. Wait, okay, so you're now not recommending it. You literally proposed it a second ago. <laughs> I floated it. You the, floated it. The Japanese, however, who yep. can borrow for infinite amounts of time at 0.1%, okay, could buy all the that. world's stock I don't want to be doing that. Right. Anyway, this is And crash the exchange right. rate and solve all their problems. Okay. 
It's getting rowdy. Okay, literally. <laughs> that is literally what the election is for. This is a haven of peace. Okay, right. I think we should wrap up there before there's a fist fight at the back. There, look, can we thank Heather for her book and Martin thank for her response? Thank you all for coming. It took us a long time to get catastrophic levels of inequality. It may take us some time to get it down. So we'll have another one in chat soon. Thanks a lot, guys.